pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Super special show for you this week. We have guest Sandy Hilton with us. Sandy is the co-author of the book, Why Pelvic Pain Hurts, and she's also the co-host of Pain Science and Sensibility Podcast. She also globally instructs uh, on treating pelvic pain disorders around the world. You're going to love this show, especially if you've ever dealt with pelvic pain. Is there a is there a particular place you'd like me to start? So everybody, uh, both both men and women, can have pelvic pain. Absolutely. But a lot of times it's just refer you know talk about with women. That's but it a- is but it is also a thing with men. Absolutely. Like it's, um, I think a problem of, of our communication, <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole another podcast of how health literacy is developed and spread and not only among the people that might be seeking care, but from, from providers, um, because there's still a distressing amount of people that healthcare providers, gynecologists, urologists, urogynecologists, everybody in that area, that that still are like oh there's something you can do for that and it's not out of malice or willful neglect it's out of wow i didn't know that existed and that's that's a problem um, (laughs) that needs to change and i think the internet is doing a good help for that so if you're a person if you're a guy with with rectal pain and this is um so gentlemen will end up with with rectal pain pain just vaguely between the rectum and the base of the, the testicles, pain in the penis with sex or after sex or with peeing, um, yeah, a feeling of, I don't have these parts, but I, I imagine that a feeling like your testicles are being squeezed and yanked back up into your body probably doesn't feel good. Um, and, and those are like the descriptions that I hear from the guys. Um, so you're, you, know, you're, you, you wake up one day like that or it gradually gets worse and you go seek help online or at your doctor and it's a scary place out there for finding information that's going to be helpful um and many young guys that i see they they'll come across stuff on the internet of people that have been suffering with this for years 10 years 20 years and and they're they're like at 23 thinking is this my life now like Mm. like this is it this is what i get and we'll go to a urologist because that's where the guys end up going and and most urologists are trained with bladder. <laughs> so if, you're, if your prostate's healthy and your bladder's doing fine and there's nothing, there's no STDs, there's no, there's no cancer important to screen for, but then the answer is often, well, I don't know, good luck with that. And not out of malice, not out of um, willful neglect, it, but out of legitimate our education system for our healthcare providers globally needs to be better. Um, Cause then you're the person trying to get help and, and you're just told, well, eh. um, that's, that's horrible. Um, so that's the worst case scenario is that you have this golf ball in your rectum and you're told to just live with it, um, which is not true. There's stuff that can be done. We just need better, better education all around, better, better capturing the people in need to get them into care quicker um that's all (laughs) uh that's all kind of a lot um so okay so if a guy finds out that his bladder is healthy and his prostate's healthy and and everything that is known to be checked looks good but he's having these issues what does he do right and so first i think take a moment to go yay it's not cancer um I get to keep my prostate because they're important. And okay, take a minute now. Where can I make this go away? And that's that's where I would hope that a healthcare provider would say, "Fabulous, we've screened you. You're safe. Go to a provider that can help you with this." Now, I am so biased because I'm a physical therapist that does public health. So I'm going to say, go to a physical therapist that does pelvic health. But there are other providers who do this too. But my, because this is my world, I'm going to talk about like it's just us. And I know it's not. Um, but you need someone that, that understands the anatomy and physiology of the area so that they're going to lead you in an efficient direction with stuff that, that is most likely to be helpful. Um, 
and we we know some things with that. Um, some important things with that is that whoever you see and do see someone, whoever you see understands that pain can change, that it's not permanent, um, that, that this isn't what your life is going to be from here on out. And that that needs to be consistently said across everyone so that the person that's like, I'm going to be like this forever, gets a consistent message that says it's going to, it might be hard. It might be like weirdly easy, or it could be really hard to change this. And, and all of that's normal um, as far as what we see clinically, but all of it can change. It's a matter of finding out what's going to work for that individual. And that's where pain in general is so hard because and if the back pain is still the leading cause of disability in the world, if we were good at treating pain in any profession, it wouldn't be. It's like, oh. you know, we'd have that. Oh, your back hurts here. Here's your, here's your six magic exercises to take care of it. And it would work for everyone. But that's not true because it's unique to the person. And there's a lot that goes into it. It can change. It's just, it's not that, not that cookbook E. Um, so that needs to be known. And then, then I think this is where my bias comes in. Then I think you need a good physical assessment of the muscles in the area, just like you would for your shoulder or your foot, um, of do the pelvic muscles. They're unique. They, um, they're the ones that, that have multiple functions. The, they run from your pubic bone in the front to your tailbone in the back. And they're like a little sling and, um, everyone has them and, and they're supposed to be like, you know, if you're holding a box in your hands and someone is slowly adding weight to it, you mm -hmm. use more and more muscle in your arms. But you're never like doing bicep curls with the box unless you're just being a brat. Um, you're just holding it steady. But it takes more and more effort as that gets heavier. And, and then you'd empty the box and you would need less effort. And that pretty much describes what happens with with the tension in the pelvic floor that should grow as bladders fill or there's stool needing to come out, it should su provide support until you go empty. And then they're supposed to relax. And a lot of times with pelvic pain problems, those muscles don't relax or they've forgotten how to relax or relaxing hurts, but that, that part of the process is missing. And then you end up with stiff, tight, usually painful tissues that, that you can't rest. Like if your foot hurts, you could, you could lie down and put it on the back of the sofa, but you cannot do that with your pelvic muscles because when you breathe or pee or have sex or poop or sit down or stand up or move, they have a job to do. Um, so it's, it can hurt sometimes. And that's again where the education comes in because you're not stuck like this, pain can change. These muscles have some function. Let's help you find out what yours are doing and come up with an individualized plan to help them get back to normal is kind of the framework. What that looks like is just all kinds of different things. So, so we start out with a message of hope that you're not stuck um, and that it, the, the pain can go away. Mm -hmm. And then we try to figure out what the issue is uh, through muscle assessment yep. um, or functional assessment. So if, if they're chronically tight though, and they don't know how to relax, and that's what causes a lot of times causes the issue, how do you encourage relaxation in the pelvic floor to help <laughs> it remember how to do what it's designed to do? Right. It's um, that's a really good question because, because it's different. And I think, yeah, I've talked, I've gotten in the before times, I've got to, to go around the world and teach classes on this. And, and there are some cultural differences to the resting state of pelvic floors of the people who come to my classes. And it's, it's hilariously interesting about how different humans are. Um, culturally, as I'm an American, I've noticed over the years, this is totally not scientific, it's just what, what I've seen, is that we're kind of uptight people, mm. um, you know? And, and um, I, I ascribe this to Diane Lee, a physiotherapist in Canada, that, that 
the first time I think I heard it was from her of people being different kinds of grippers. Like you have people that, that grip tightly around the rib cage or their jaw or their pelvic floor. And if you happen to be a butt gripper, then you need to learn to stop that because it's just literally getting in your way. And that's, uh. that's true. We, we brace, it's a normal function to, to brace if we're going to be ready for a hard thing. We do that with lifting or sports. If you think of the guy that's, I'm, I'm going to mess it up if I try and name a position off the top of my head with no coffee. But so, so you're playing <laughs> ball of any kind and you know someone's going to throw the ball to you. You're braced and you're ready for it. Because you have to, physics wise, you have to stop that momentum. So even like in baseball, you're going to have to stop that so that you can then throw it again. And that means your muscles have a certain set of tone that they need to be in to be ready. So your arm doesn't just get ripped off, but um, then you stop and do something else. Uh, so it's normal to brace at certain times and then you must stop. Um, and that, that's a spot where we check because either you're bracing ineffectively, like with everything, can't catch a baseball that way either. Um, you need that, that elegance of only bracing with some parts of you. Um, or inefficiently where your timing is off or you do it, but then you can't stop doing it. And those have three different ways that you change it. Um, so it, it really comes down to just if and. I tell my students like get the whiteboard out and, and draw. And I learned this in PT school a million years ago. Of, um, if it's tight, stretch it. If it's weak, strengthen it. If it's not in the right place, put it back. If they don't know how to do it, teach them themselves. And, and that's still kind of the if-then logic tree that's in my head. Of, is this a coordination problem? Yes or no? Is it a, you know, and then you design your plans around that. Um, and it might be a lot of things, but then you just have a lot of little plans. Uh, so it can look like this really super complex problem, but when you break it into the if-then statements, it's not welcome to my head. How I think about things, um, and I, you know, it's it makes it possible where it's like ah, I can't do the things. It's like okay, well, let's take one of these things and we'll change it, and then let's see how that change affects the rest of it. Was that enough of a linchpin that other physiological processes go? Oh, hey, I can work now, um, or or do you need to say okay, well, we've got this little piece now when you after you, you contract your pelvic muscles like you would need to, now they've learned to relax back again. Did that change anything? And, and now let's reassess and see what you're doing. We're gonna keep that skill that you have recovered. And now let's, let's do this other stuff and see, and there'll be a tipping point where function starts to be more normal again. Mm. That is different for everyone. But yeah, like, like Americans, man, we got, we got some strong, pelvic floors that like to contract sometimes and forget how to stop. Um, and teaching relaxation can get very Americanized too. Relax now. I'm going to be the best, fastest relaxer ever. I'm going to relax better than anyone else have ever relaxed before is the opposite of helpful. So, so, so just so I'm following, um, when you talk about, when you talk about uh, bracing, uh, are you talking about like, uh, say, clenching or perpetual Kate Kegel where you, you, you just grip and you can't, you just don't let it go? Yeah, sometimes. Um, and you would not notice that you're doing that because normal is that, it, normal is you don't know you have pelvic floor muscles. Uh, we don't have to teach babies to do Kegels, to be at Kegels, Kegels, to be able to function. It comes with all of the squats and climbing and rolling and all of and breathing and, and use. So normal pelvic function is blissful ignorance of it. I like that description. Um, so, and you also said that some people uh, recruit everything to brace. What is yeah. that like? You mean like, like stomach muscles, leg muscles, butt muscles? Butt muscles, thigh muscles. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's also normal in a short period, if you think, if you've ever taught someone how to, or remember when you learned how to cut with scissors, mm -hmm. it's so cute because like their eyebrows are working and their toes are curling and their tongue's sticking out and everything's working, right? To follow that line. As you get better with the skill, you become more refined, more graceful, more elegant with it. Um, that, so, so I don't give people a hard time for that. It's like, you're using all your things to, to do this. It's just a, it just shows me how hard the task is for them right now. And 
and normal is that it's unconscious. So, so they're pretty far away from unconscious grace and we need to get that back. Uh, Do you think and, uh, that Americans are so uptight because the whole area is like taboo or? I, I think that that's part of it is that cultural, don't, don't talk about it, don't look at it. Um, like if we did that, you remember back in, well, I don't, I've read, I wasn't, I'm not that old, but back in early England, when ankles were like, ooh, terribly sexy, you should never show them. Um, I have heard that kind of. <laughs> I, would, I would imagine that an ankle sprain would be like, mm, this part of me that no one's supposed to look at hurts, what do I do with it? Um, that's that's kind of how, how it is, because you're not, you know, there's some religious cultures that you're not supposed to touch yourself there what if their hurts and you can't normally like i famous for banging into things when i walk past it i also apologize to the inanimate objects so <laughs> sorry table it's very kind i was very, very but but normally what you do is you look at it you touch it you reassure that that oh my goodness that's sharp stabbing pain oh okay it's fine um but if that's in a part of you that is culturally religiously, personally unacceptable to look at, touch, or heaven forbid, show someone else or compare with theirs, what what kind of reassurance do you have that the part's okay? And they think that if we think our the part's not okay, it's really hard to use it normally. We protect it more. And that's where you get some of that global guarding. Um, it's from a, a, I don't know if this part is safe, I should protect it. And that can be by muscle stiffness, it can be by not using it, it can be, which is really awkward if it's peeing or pooping, that's the problem. Um, the, it can be by inflammation in the area. There's all sorts of physiological possibilities that go with that. Wow. Oh, so it's fun. It, and that's why like, no one's the same. It's right. Like, all right, you have rectal pain. Let's see, what, let's see what comes with this. So here's a, this might be an odd question, but I don't think it will be odd for you. So you said that you have to, like you, if it, if it was an injured shoulder, you would assess the shoulder. Mm -hmm. How do you, how can you assess the, the pelvic area to see what's going on? Um, it's, it's orthopedics in a cave. You check um, okay. muscle function. We have for, for people with male body parts, you have rectal entrance. So you do a rectal exam. The pelvic muscles live between a superficial and deep layer and then hip muscles that you can access um, internally. The, the superficial muscles live between like fingernail depth to the first knuckle. Uh, the deeper muscles are about up to the second knuckle and then the hip operator and those guys, <laughs> I'm gesturing like it's a dinosaur. Um, the, <laughs> you go all the way in with the glove that comes up to your shoulder. And so you're usually like one or two knuckles, maybe all the way up to the length of my finger if I'm looking, um, hip muscle wise, um, but it's a, it's a musculoskeletal assessment. Just like if you were working on someone's jaw and you okay. wanted to check in the mouth, you would put a glove on and check the muscles in the mouth. Um, so we rectal or, or vaginal assessments of what the muscles are doing. There's more room vaginally. So if, a, if that's an option <laughs> and someone has rectal pain, sometimes they're way more comfortable having a vaginal examination of what the muscles are doing than working directly on those tissues um, or just culturally, they're not wanting someone to do a rectal exam. Um, and I allow a lot of choice in that, um, which sounds it's a horrible way to say that. I allow you choice. Um, I am fine with people saying, I don't even want an internal assessment. If there are reasons that they're not okay with that, if they don't want an internal assessment, besides just the cruelty of doing that to someone that has said no, um, it is those muscles are gonna be tighter. That's part of their action is to protect against threat. So if I'm the threat they're protecting against, I already know they hurt and now I found stiff muscles. It doesn't tell me anything but I'm one more provider that didn't listen to them. And that's uh, not helpful. So if someone says, I don't want an internal assessment, I say, okay, cool. Here's what we can find out externally. Um, are you comfortable getting undressed so I can visually assess? Do you not even want to do that? Do you want to just sit out here in the waiting room? We can talk through it. Um, and I, I will make that fit the person's needs. They are free to change their mind later. Um, 
but but I'm not going to tell them they can't get better unless I do a thing they don't want to have happen. I will find another way. Um, and, and I hope that I do that for any body part, but I very specifically do that in the pelvic region and the mouth. Those are really sensitive areas where stuff's happened and you're like this and you can't relax if you're, if you're like, mm, no. Um, so yeah. I don't, I don't even know if that answered the question because I got on one of my soapboxes. Well, well it kind of, no. Don't do that if, you, if someone says no. But so to me, your message is awesome because what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is that you meet them where they're at mm. um, so that you don't continue to perpetuate the guarding and the, the fear right. and the, the issue and the, that they're already having. The dismissiveness that some people come against Um that I think is probably offered as a way of reassuring people, but it comes off not that at all. Um, so the words are really careful. Reading body language is really careful, just as I mean, it's kind of easy to tell if someone's all twisted up sideways and going, legs are crossed and they're like this, that they're not like, yeah, a rectal exam sounds fabulous to me. <laughs> maybe not, um, you know, maybe we talk until they relax a little bit and they're not so, clenched with their whole self at the prospect. Um, yeah, I've had people that I work, uh, the first first visit, first assessment was done via telehealth, which I think is fabulous. Because if you're, if you're a person in, in pain in the pelvis and everyone you've gone to has, has caused more pain in the assessment of your pain, how, one, wow, you're still trying to get help and that's impressive. Two, try really hard not to be another person that causes more pain. Is there a way we can do this to say, I understand you're in pain. I don't need to prove it because you've just told me exactly what's happening from where you heard. Okay. What are all the things we can do that don't hurt? And some people are so protected that it's actually really helpful to do a telehealth assessment the first time because there is no way I can touch you. You are in your house, in your safe place, talking to a computer that you can just turn off if it's too much instead of having had to get dressed, drive to a place, be in someone else's office. How do you get out if it's scary? Are you gonna hurt their feelings? Are, you gonna, are they gonna listen to you? All of those things are removed and we can have a discussion about what's going on. Um, I kind of like that. Like, I just want to do that for my first ones for a lot of people. And now, is that a new discovery with the Corona or had yeah. you already done yeah. that? Yeah, well, I had done some before of people that just for, for reasons couldn't get in, but, mm -hmm. but now it's, now we're doing it a lot more and I find that I really like it um, for a lot of reasons. That is pretty neat. I mean, cause I, it takes, uh, there's a lot of vulnerability uh, for a person. Lots. <laughs> Right? No matter what part hurts, because you're trusting someone to not yes. be mean. Like, like, I don't know, maybe it's just because of my brother. <laughs> but look, this part hurts. He'd grab it and move it. It's like, I just told you it hurt. Why? Why did you just do that to me? Um, so that might, that might have formed a lot of how I treat people. Don't be that. Um, the, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you trust people. Like you go to a dentist with a tooth, you trust that they're not going to go jabbing around the gums. They're going to be gentle with that. We we need to we need to treat that with respect and 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 feel honored that someone is trusting us with a vulnerable, painful part of themselves, and to respect that and be nice with it. Hard. You got to work hard enough to make a difference, and sometimes that has some soreness. But there is a difference between, oh my God, I'm dying here, and wow, that was a good workout. Right. Um, even in pelvic health. I, I also imagine too, by the time somebody, once they found you, they're, because we are uptight, they're probably mm -hmm. past the, or very much deep into the desperation phase because a lot of people are uptight. And you, you we, when you started out talking how some people, Maybe they, they just live with it in silence or they for a while because they don't know what to do. And then they start Googling. And mm -hmm. but, you know, I, but like I used to be in the fire department and um, we would hear about people jumping out of windows, uh, you know, and dying. Yeah. But the fire was so hot, they were desperate to get away from it. Right. 
and that so, seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah, so desperation makes you move sometimes. <laughs> yeah. To yeah. seek help. Um, yeah, for all kinds of reasons. And you, and you just sit there and, and ask, you know, what brought you here now? And then let people tell you. Um, it's fun. It's fun because um, like some, these are humans, right? And and they're they're testing you just like you were doing a musculoskeletal skeletal assessment, they're testing you. Are you going to listen to me? Are you going to, are you, are you going to get me? Um, is it, am I safe here? Those kind of things. Um, boy. And when we talk about pelvic things, um, here's a timely discussion. It is, it is um, in America at this time, it is possible to go to a healthcare provider that thinks that your way of life, your way of being, your desire of how you're gonna use your body is a horrible, terrible thing that shouldn't exist. Um, especially around transgender, non-binary, same-sex relationships. Um, and you have a part that hurts that fits into that category. Um, how safe is that environment that you just walked into? How much do you trust that healthcare provider? Are they someone that, are they one of the 73 million people who, who voted for an administration that wants to make transgender not exist? And you happen to be a transgender individual. How's that gonna do with your ability of your pelvic muscles to relax? Um, you know, it's, so those kind of things come in to, as a healthcare provider, or I think that our role is to provide a, an atmosphere and a, and a place of possibility for change for the person in front of you and everything they bring with them and, and not to judge it and not to, uh, as one of my students said, can I swear on here? <laughs> so yeah. students, yeah. It's not really even that sweary these days, but so we, we were talking in, in kind of the welcome to entropy physiotherapy. Here's how you do. Um, and the, the summary that he came up with was, so basically don't be a dick. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, pretty much. You know, someone's going to tell you what's important to them and what, how they're using their part. Listen and help them design a program to use their part more efficiently. Um, not get all judgy about who they're using their part with or how often or how many people or uh, things like that because because of how reflexive just be a kind human it's one but also how reflexive and reactive reactive the pelvic region is to stress if we're trying to get someone with a non-relaxing pelvic floor to relax but our environment or ourselves is a trigger of a stress response it's probably not going to go really well because yeah, their, like... their autonomic nervous system is going to be like, uh, uh this is not safe for me. Well, and that's the that's the thing. The nervous system is always looking for safe, not safe. Mm -hmm. Which is it? And I, like, you know, safe. Okay, I'll Scanning. let you do this. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. safe. I'm going to draw up and take away. Absolutely, which would be then a normal response. Very. So then, then it's not fair for us to say, oh, your pelvic floor doesn't relax. <laughs> well, it would not be normal for it to relax under these circumstances. So actually it gets an A plus. Yay. <laughs> Let's see if we can create an environment where it would be normal for it to relax. Can it relax there? Do you find giving that, so safe, not safe, do you find sometimes the issue is manifesting, showing physical, but it's really got a, a, an emotional root to it? I think that everything does. Um, which is also normal. Right. But um, yes, <laughs> to varying degrees. And that comes to expectation and what's happened to you all the other times and, and why it can be so powerful if you keep all that in mind as a provider to have like, what if, how cool is this? If every time you've got a sense of a golf ball in your rectum that never goes away, pooping is excruciating, it hurts too bad to have sex, can't sit down. Um, and you've managed to get dressed and get into one more provider and the exam doesn't hurt. Like how freaking cool is that to your brain? Because it's like, this is gonna hurt, this is gonna hurt, this is gonna hurt this, whoa, how'd that happen? And in that space of confounded expectations, um, possibility exists to go, all right, look, I just did the exam and it didn't hurt. Well, it's gonna hurt later, maybe maybe not. And 
didn't hurt now. So let's talk about that. What was different about this? How can we reproduce this? And, and what could you do if it starts to hurt later to turn it back down again? Because in this moment, it does not hurt. And well, it's not gonna last. Okay. And in this moment, it does not hurt. I really am that much of a brat. <laughs> I was like, yes, but right now. The, and, and you reproduce that over and over again and that confounds the expectation and starts to change. No, so you create the space for a paradigm shift. Absolutely. Because so like in, in when I see clients, maybe they have knee pain, they've had it for 10 years, but after you know learning how to breathe and in five minutes they move and the knee pain's not there. Yeah. You see this light bulb go it's off like, in their whoa. face like, I've always had this pain, but now I don't. And then they have mm -hmm. to wrestle with it. But that creates the opportunity for hope and for yeah, a change. Exactly. Yeah. And and penises and vaginas and testicles and clitorises are, are, are different, but no different. In the, wait a minute, that always hurt and now it doesn't. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so let me ask you this, because you said it's always, most always emotional or there's a, a trigger. There's a piece to it. The yeah. human, there's a human attached to that part. So Correct. Yes. Do you, do you find that, and I think well, you may have already answered it, but do sometimes along with the helping them remember how their body's designed to, to move and, and be, do you find that sometimes you also help with uh, how they're help them with their emotions or like, do you ever end up being on a, not just a physical therapist, but also uh, an emotional therapist, a human, a human coach. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yes. And, and that would be, okay. I said it, so that would be normal for the pelvis, right? It's like, there's a physiological function to this area, but for really anywhere. And, and yeah, and you're teaching people life skills because if what, if what you got into is this unfortunate event, not to minimize horrible, horrific, terrible event, unfortunate event, just bad habits. And you ended up in a thing that ended up like, I have this non-relaxing pelvic floor and, um, and you learn a skill where you can relax it again. And part of that skill is doing like this really just simple body scan. And I'm a sci-fi nut. So I think of like a little red laser. And, and as you find a spot that's, that's not doing okay, you change it. And it's just like comb and tangles out of your hair. <laughs> there's a lot of hair here. And you know there's a tangle because you found it. You know it's gone because it's gone now. And you don't expect it to come back. You get new ones, but you take care of those too. Um, and if, if tension in our body can be re rephrased that way, it's like, ah, that part's tight. Okay, cool. Untighten it. And, and they do, then that's a skill. And it, and it's very helpful for blood pressure, for circulation, for stress levels, which have huge parasympathetic and sympathetic consequences for our body, um, to, to get in a habit of every once in a while throughout the day, just do a quick little scan, unclench the stuff that's clenched, wiggle around a little bit, carry on, check your breathing. Are you all uptight here and not letting your body move like it's supposed to is what keeps it healthy. And, and those are simple things that we get out of a habit of doing that you can create that habit again. And if we wanna create healthy habits, it's most easy to tie that to something you already do. And you start with the easy ones like, I don't know. Do you enjoy having your tea in the morning? Yeah, great. Do it then, because it's, it's a it's a nice, comfortable, safe spot. And then you shift that as as skill is acquired into what's the worst situation you can imagine that happens in your daily life. Try it there. Can you sit in a really uncomfortable environment, do a body scan, and unclench stuff? Because my patients and my poor students who hear this constantly for however many weeks they're there. Um, there is nothing you can clench on the inside that's gonna change any of that. And you just end up stiff and uncomfortable and grumpy, which doesn't help. It's anti-helpful. So if you get a skill where you're like, I'm in a very uncomfortable environment, I'm gonna do a body scan and unclench all the things and just breathe. It's still it's an uncomfortable environment. Um, however, when you are done in that situation, you're in a way better place and you have avoided a lot of stuff that's not helpful. So that that is, you end up teaching skills like that. Because I said before, the normal pelvis is that we are blissfully unaware of it. What I don't want people to do is have to think, is my puborectalis relaxed right now? Because that's unhelpful. Like with your knee patients, where's my kneecap pointing? 
all day long would be really not good. Um, so we want just normal healthy habits to be part of a life skill. Um, and I'll have them do a whole body scan so they don't get hyper-focused on a part. Um, so, so have you found that you teach a, uh, a very practical way for meditation, relaxation, and spiritual enlightenment? And then when you introduce these skills to people... <laughs> <laughs> Pretty, I mean, it's kind of, and you also have to understand there's different people come in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about like plants or animals, right? So, so like I'm, if I'm a, if I was a plant, I'd be the kind of plant that dies in full sun. <laughs> like, absolutely. Don't do that to me. I'm, I'm good. I'm like shade, partial shade kind of person. And, um, ugh. And, and I'd wilt and just wither away to nothingness. People are like that sort of, or like, like um, I we had labs growing up and you don't, if you create a lab, I never did that. My, my sister, picking on my family here, they won't listen. The, like she had this lab that she created and, and then they were gone all day and then they played for like a half an hour and then she wanted to create the lab again for sleep. And I'm like, when, when is this kinetic creature gonna burn off some of that adrenaline? They're not gonna sleep well. You're gonna need to, you know, run and i feel like that when people say okay so take a nice cleansing breath and relax if there's a lot of adrenaline rolling around in me i that's not going to go well but if i do something physical burn off some of that then i have a lot easier time doing any relaxation kind of stuff um other people are exactly the opposite and i think they don't have to do it the way i do it they just need to figure out what works best for them and do that um, there's a lot of expectation, especially in the public health world, do yoga, that will help you. It's like, if you are completely uptight and raging adrenaline bundle, like I get, doing yoga is going to make me more uptight. But if I so, go for a jog first, and then I do yoga, I actually like it. So, you know, fit the person. I love it. I mean, yeah. So you're talking about seeing individuals and not just seeing symptoms yeah. or protocols. But we work on the symptoms. Yes. Yeah. I know. I like principles, not protocols. The concept of a protocol for treating pelvic pain makes me absolutely irritated um, because I don't know how you could have one that would encompass all of those normal variations um, and encourage people that their normal variation is normal. They get to be them. They don't have to be someone else's normal. Um, so one of my colleagues saved me on that. And she said, no, what you're talking about is principles, not protocols. Mm. And I was like, thank you. Yes, <laughs> I will take that. There are some principles to follow, but maybe, maybe a million subset protocols that you would choose was my little if-then statements, um, but, but not one to rule them all. So if someone, if everyone is the design is blissfully unaware that you have a pelvic floor. Yeah. Let's say that there's a lot of people out there that are quite aware that they do have a pelvic floor. What, what, what should they do? What would be your best advice? Um, if it was, if it was a telehealth, thing, I was just talking to someone on the phone yesterday about this, because that's a, a thing they're going through. Um, is well, you know, try some things and see if it can feel better. Like, what does your pelvic floor need? Does it need time? Does it need time resting because it's not getting that? Does it? Does it? Um, is it resting all the time and it forgot it has a job? Could, does it need some reminders? You know, what? Where are you on those those possibilities? And then, then we, like the person I was talking to the other day, it seems like without a physical assessment, I'm just guessing. But it seems like it's a it's a, a lot of tension kind of issue. Um, so we're like, what if what if you took some time during the day to do that? Take a nice breath as you breathe in. Let the pelvic floor relax a little bit, and then as you breathe out, it should just rest back to normal, just easy. And then again, it's breathe to the spaces between your toes is what I was taught, and I'm just like, I love the poetry of that because not what's my pelvic floor doing, but I'm going to take a breath in, I'm going to let everything move and let everything come back. And I'm going to try and let my pelvic floor do that too. For some people that's super easy. And for some people it's distressing and they end up with shorter, faster breath trying to do it. 
which would give you a clue. And then you'd say, okay, cool, that didn't work. So, and it's some, that was a thing. So what if you were sitting in your most comfortable chair and tried it there? Can you let the pelvic floor relax as you breathe in and come back up? And they'll, they'll say inevitably, that's why you need 50 million ideas. <laughs> I can't sit, okay. <laughs> What if you were lying in your bed? What's your, you know what? What's your most comfortable position? <laughs> like, we'll stop guessing. And, and we just do it that way. Is where, where do you feel the best, the most like you? Can you try this there and see what happens? Awesome. And it will, it should be one of three things. It will either get worse, get better, or be no different. And I can work with those answers. So if it gets worse, it's okay. I know how to change that. If it gets better, fabulous. We're just going to do more in that direction. If it doesn't change, then I just need more ideas. So, yeah, it's, a, it's all logic. It just comes down to if they end statements and logic. Maybe. So if someone were interested in having a virtual session with you and learning more about the work that you do, where would they go? They could go to entropy.physio, our website, or they could email me. Um, at sandy at entropy.physio um, and, and just ask. Or if you're not a, a website, I just realized I did that. No phone option. Um, <laughs> or they could call me at the clinic um, and I will check my message and call back. I will put all that in the notes of the, yeah. the show. So they'll yeah, be and able I'd to find you. it. And, and there's, there's people all around the world that can help. And, and that's really good news because there's people all around the world that have pelvic floors. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, like, it goes back to that, that if I need to not be the threat they have to protect against in a pain situation. And quite humbly, I might have a voice they don't like. I might remind them of their kindergarten teacher that they hated. I might look like their ex. I might, you know, it's like, there's all of those, cues that someone may never really feel great around you but never really be able to say why um so you have other people around it's like or or you might look at them and be like oh my god you remind me of my my cousin that and i can't be objective around you then you pass them off to someone else so they can have a better clearer picture and you know we just have because it's such a you get into so much personal discussion that it and you need to so it, there might be some interpersonal stuff that you're just not a good fit. Um, or you might live six hours away and you just can't get there. Then, then what, where I'm going with this is even if I'm not in your area or, or just not right, then there's other people that can help and, and we can help people find people really awesome. literally anywhere on the planet because um, there are people. And, and more and more all the time and more guys treating pelvic health, which both Sarah, my business partner and I are kind of like, we need more guys in treating pelvic health conditions because there are people that aren't gonna be okay with a female. And, and that could be female male or non-binary or what, I mean, there's reasons you were like, I need a guy helping me with this. All right, we need to have guys that can help with this. Um, so same. <laughs> sorry sorry long answer no um, it was beautiful it takes a village to raise a child i mean i love no, it No, truly and, and it's not our egos because sometimes it really is like i don't know i just didn't like them you know and someone else will say the exact same thing and they're like oh this makes perfect sense like, okay the most important thing is we get people to people to help them because it's pain's hard and and there's no point in staying in it any longer than you have to robs the fun of everything else and the most important message is pain can change and go away it does and can change yes and if you want to hear that from the one of the researchers in it the like in my spare time we do pain science and sensibility podcast and we had um professor laura mosley on there recently so it's one of it's like it's not the one that just came out it's the one before that i think episode 49 um and um and he says that he's talking about the research of, because a patient of mine asked me to ask him, um, I've had this pain for a while. You're telling me it can change. A lot of doctors have told me it can't. 
ask this guy. That's what he does. So, so I got to him. I was like, so, and he's like, yes, absolutely. It take, it can take time. Um, but, but as long as you're breathing, I think is what he said, as long as you're breathing, there is still time to work on changing it. Amen. Right on. Yeah. Well, Sandy, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's so fun. It's like, I, I can talk about this. I love it. This is more just getting me to shut up. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.